Today, we are meeting across Lutruwita, Tasmania, Aboriginal land, sea and waterways and online. I acknowledge with deep respect the traditional owners of this land, the Palawa people. The Palawa people belong to the oldest continuing culture in the world. They cared and protected country for thousands of years. They knew this land, they lived on the land and they died on these lands and I honour them. I pay my respects to elders past and present, to the many Aboriginal people that did not make elder status and to the Aboriginal, the Tasmanian Aboriginal community that continue to care for country. I recognise a history of truth which acknowledges the impacts of invasion and colonisation upon Aboriginal people resulting in the forcible removal from their lands. Our island is deeply unique with spectacular landscapes, with our cities and towns surrounded by bushland, wilderness, mountain ranges and beaches. I stand for a future that profoundly respects and acknowledges Aboriginal perspectives, culture, language and history, and a continued effort to fight for Aboriginal justice and rights paving the way for a strong future. Whenever I talk to school groups about historic maps, I start by asking the students to take a few minutes to draw out a simple sketch map of their route to school or perhaps some other familiar route. They should think about what features they always notice. What features act as waypoints? Is the route fairly straight? Is it fairly bendy? Is it quite hilly? Is it quite flat? Now, depending on the time and the group dynamic, I might then ask a few to share their maps with us. And very rarely is there a map that makes sense to anyone but the creator. So here you can see mine showing the route uh, from a house I used to live in to the university. So you can see in this map that there's my house at the beginning. Uh, I would leave that, walk past a letterbox that was quite useful when I needed to forward on all that mail. Uh, past the really friendly cat who would always demand a pat when I walked past, the coffee shop, a roundabout with nice trees and a playground, go down the roller coaster that is Linton Ave in South Hobart, and then at the bottom you've got that slightly weird sort of Adams family house on the corner, and then you'd wander along and get to the university. So I am not going to ask you to draw one of these maps today, but the core principle of the exercise is useful, especially as we approach historic maps. I use this task to get students thinking about what detail is included in a map and who gets to decide that. The lesson here is that maps are created for specific purposes and therefore contain and exclude information as they serve their purpose. Now, as with all historical documents, understanding this should inform how we read a historic map. So this afternoon, we're going to look at the four very general stages of creating a map of exploration. As we move through, we will see the journey a historic map took from messy scribbles in a surveyor's journal through to the cleansed version created for wider publication. Van Diemen's Land is a really good case study as it was only 20 years between when the Europeans first started to explore the lands and the inclusion of Van Demonian maps in London-based engravers' catalogues. Becomes a very manageable set of records as it's limited to a relatively small area and a compressed time period. Now there are frustrating gaps in those records when documents simply weren't created, but we have a self-restricting set of records to work with. And for the historian, this can be a blessing. Our data sets are usually scrounged and scraped from assorted creators, archives per and purposes which presents a distinct challenge when it's necessary to refine it to a representative sample. Today, it's easy to take stationary supplies for granted. Sure, there's never a pen to hand when you need one, but you don't normally need to wait four months for the next ship to arrive and hope that they have a spare. Usually, 
you can just go into the next room. And this is where we start with the desperate circumstances most early settlements found themselves in. Now Van Diemen's land was much like any other colony. It was remote, it was removed, it took a long time to get supplies and uh, they were making do with whatever they could. Now supply shortages manifest in any number of ways and it might be a shortage of records. There are very few survey records or maps that survive in Van Diemen's land before 1814. Now this could be because they weren't actually made or because they haven't survived. Now paper was a valuable commodity and one that wasn't easy for the early settlements to make for themselves. Low quality inks could be manufactured out of charcoal or other locally sourced ingredients, but the chemicals that are needed to make satisfactory paper were often in very short supply. And so large scale paper mills were usually a later addition to a settlement. And even in London, the value of paper was recognized. This letter here was written in Britain to Van Diemen's Land in 1838, and it uses cross hatching to fit more writing onto each sheet. So when government officials and private settlers wrote home, they made requests for private supplies of stationery. I'm constantly baffled by how they were expected to do their jobs without the basic supplies but everything about the Australian colony says the project was funded on a shoestring, so maybe it's not that surprising. Now, with every ship that arrived in Hobart or Sydney came a flurry of notices in the newspapers about merchants having fresh stock, including writing materials and various other stationary supplies. But when there weren't any ships on the, uh, on the horizon, Desperate publishers and artists posted advertisements asking to buy supplies from anyone who had any spare. And it wasn't only paper that was in short supply. Now being both ubiquitous and lacking makes it a great example of colonial supply and demand. But the reality is that the Europeans were reliant on ships to bring almost everything, including nails, fabrics and food. Over time, naturally, the colonies began to become more self-sufficient and then even to produce an export amount that they could send out onwards. But in the early years, it was a really tough slog, especially when they were reluctant to adopt native foods. So I want to open by emphasizing this aspect of an early colony because these shortages extended beyond everyday objects and onto specialized equipment required by specialists, such as surveyors set with the task of exploring and measuring the newly claimed lands. Exploration could be fairly basic. So here you can see James Meehan's journals measuring the Sydney area using a watch and compass only. Now under this system, uh, they would get their watch and uh, note what time they left and what direction they left in and then approximate um, and then uh, and then record where they were after a set amount of time. This would give a general idea of the landscape, even if it wasn't that accurate. But uh, this notebook by Meehan, who was an Irish rebel, uh, he was a convict, he was sent out to the colonies before he'd been involved in the Irish rebellion. He had been a school teacher and perhaps a surveyor. So he was sent out, he was uh, made assistant to Charles Grimes, who was the surveyor of New South Wales, and he quite quickly moved up in the ranks, becoming a highly esteemed surveyor in his own right. So he carried this little notebook with him on these journeys. Now this map shows the road from Kangaroo Point to Richmond, and it was surveyed by William Dawson under the oversight of John Halls in 1832. And it was described as very incorrect. Now perhaps this was because it was being conducted by a trainee, possibly he was having equipment problems. A few months later, Halls was requested to hand his theodolite into the survey office for reasons unknown. Now I wonder if there were ongoing issues of accuracy with his work. 
Unperturbed, he continued on measuring Richmond, although his journal records that not having my own instruments, I'm certain not certain that the township is correctly connected until I try it with my own. Now, throughout the first 30 years of the Van Diemen's Land colony, the surveyors reco record issues and deficiencies with their equipment. Even in the 1830s, convict assistants were being sent out to work without appropriate footwear because the stores were short. Now, as we consider the different stages of map making, keep these issues in mind. Surveyor error is a significant element of the messiness of colonial cartography, but it was not by no means the only cause, nor was it always within the control of the surveyor. The maps, whether sketches in the margin or works covered in gold leaf, were constructed under multiple pressures and reflect all of them. So let's have a look at some of the pressures that came into play at certain stages. The first step I'm going to discuss is that of exploration, when the surveyors, explorers and their assistants stepped away from the camp to traverse unfamiliar landscapes. Now, to be honest, at this stage, maps are far and are few and far between. We could argue about what makes a map and decide to accept the coordinates and measurements uh, in a notebook as a map, and that increases our bounty a little. But the reality is it can be quite difficult to find the informal notebooks that travelled with the explorers. So after days or weeks or months out in the field, the team staggered back to base camp. Different members of the team had different roles. Large-scale expeditions usually had a mixture of artists, surveyors, geologists, and others who would record everything they saw. Now we see these beautiful drawings made either in the tent after a long day's work or hopefully after a long bath on return. These sketches show everything from flora to topography to navigation routes and they have a sense of informality that can really belie their purpose. Now the next stage is that they would, that the surveyors or others would draw up a nicer version, complete with the cartouche and decorative twiddly bits. At this point their use as a colonial, a tool of colonial propaganda goes public. These are the versions that are created for much wider consumption. Finally, the map was whisked away off into the world of engravers and printing presses where it would take on a whole new life. By this point, accuracy is often irrelevant. Some of these charts might um, be used for military purposes and so we would expect them to be accurate. But those that were printed for general consumption performed a very different role. One that, despite all claims against this, did not actually need the latest and most up-to-date detail. So let's go back to that first step. We start with the most personal of audiences, a journal written only for the explorer's eyes. This is a tiny notebook. It fits comfortably into the palm of a hand and it's fairly scruffy around the edges. It has a confusing layout. Open it from here and it reads like a book, but the back of each page is upside down. So Mian wrote through it from one end to the other and then he turned it and started from the back to the front again. Now occasionally a page will have text in both directions, filling any gap, making the most of this valuable paper. The notebook has a rustic appearance. It would sell well at a market, uh, but it was probably constructed by me and to suit his particular requirements out in the field. And it's one of four notebooks that accompanied him around the Derwent in 1803 and 1804, as he and a group of convict assistants slogged through the hills of Risdon Vale, all the way out to Sorrell, Hamilton, and down to Taruna. In these notebooks, he records losing equipment, exhausting his assistants, and firing on a group of indigenous Tasmanians, probably of the Big River Nation, when he found himself surrounded and feeling unsafe. Mian may not have been the first European seen by the, these indigenous peoples who no doubt watched his passing, whether he saw them or not. But he and his assistants were the first Europeans to walk through these lands,
That means his record, scribbled at the end of each day in pencil and then written over later in pen, captures an indigenous landscape before any European interference has occurred. So the day after departing Risdon, the Risdon Cove camp for the first time, Mian found the governor's mare wandering somewhere outside the bounds of the camp. He took her home, but she may have been the first horse to cross these lands, the first hoof to disturb these soils. This may seem like a really simple point, one tiny invasion amid so many harms of colonial action. Mian certainly doesn't appear to think anything of this moment, but it's recorded in a journal that describes in great detail an Indigenous landscape. Within a decade, many of the lands described here would be trodden down, compressed into British modes of agriculture. And this hoof is only the start of that process. As historians, we have to be careful to consider the creation of the source as well as the information it contains. Every time we look at a historical document, we ask, who made it? Who commissioned it? Who was the intended audience? What story is it trying to tell? How trustworthy is that detail? These are all sensible questions that we should be asking of anything we read of the internet, and they lie at the heart of a humanities degree but we won't go into that right now. So along with these questions, the historian also asks about the detail that has been accidentally included. And we call this reading against the grain because it's reading against the original purpose of the document. For those clues that reveal truths about the author of the document um, for, uh, that can then be extrapolated to better understand the context uh, of its creation, and therefore the information it contains. So we ask, what assumptions does the creator make? What detail do they assume don't need explaining because they were so widely understood? What does particular use of slang or pejorative terms tell us about attitudes towards a particular issue or group? What social or cultural values have influenced the way it's written or the contents it contains. Now, for many of you, uh, thinking critically like this is obvious and you're wondering why I'm explaining it. But as we look at records like Mian's journals of his travels along the Derwent, and then at how this information was recorded and shared, and then how the information was developed by other people, these are the questions that help us look beyond the records as a simple record of a man who took a walk. So a journal like William Dampier's, on the other hand, reveals different motivations. He was driven more by curiosity and the urge to explore than to drive any nation's aims of exploration or expansion. The scribbled sketches in his journals are usually focused on identifying safe harbours, showing landmarks and topography. Here is Realexa or El Realejo, and apologies to anybody for that, uh, on the Nicaraguan coast. Once you know they're the same place, you can see the similarities with the rivers going in from the coastline. But Dampier also turned his journals into a wildly successful account of his travels. So on this page, he has a short description of this area, but there are a couple of words I couldn't quite decipher, uh, although I'll keep on working on them. Now here he has turned those notes and the little sketch of the harbour with the Realexa church inland into a complete description of the settlement. I suspect he probably used these sketches away as a way of jogging his memory about each and every one of the small places that he visited. Now Dampier describes the indigenous peoples he encounters, including moments of violence, but he also admires what they and the colonizers have achieved. Meehan's journal concentrates on the landscape he is exploring 100 years later. And his work has an agenda of proving that this land can be owned by the British. But his attitudes towards First Nations peoples had also changed significantly by that time. 
because ideas of the primitive peoples and nomadic natives were dominating the discourse where they hadn't previously. So once the explorers had returned to the base camp, they would turn their attention to creating something more formal. Uh, this is the first step into creating a map that could become public, and this is where the priorities of the mission start to come to the fore. The first expeditions into an area usually followed the rivers for very practical reasons. They needed to find drinking water and a relatively fixed path to follow through the landscape. Often the river also provided a navigable route and parties would sail rather than walk, such as Thomas Scott and his party did here on their voyage of discovery along the Huon River. Finding easily navigable routes was important as it demonstrated which areas would be easy to open for settlement and resource gathering. With the shortages of supplies in mind, quickly establishing local supply chains was a prime consideration in an early colony. So this is the map that Meehan made of his journals uh, around the Derwent. He didn't remain long in Van Diemen's land after finishing this, uh, this expedition. He was summoned back to Sydney where he continued surveying there. But it has been argued that he was responsible for suggesting Sullivan's Cove as an alternative to Risdon Cove for settlement. So this map is highly colonial and it is very European. It's oriented north and it uses accepted symbology to display the landscape. There's a literal coastline, uh, a dotted line to indicate his roots and a narration about the landscape that he encountered. Now, if we look closely within these comments, we can see that they are centered very firmly within the aims of colonization. There's a good valley, where, uh, which is approximately where the lettuce farms are today outside of Richmond. There is a good deal of flat land along the area that has all the vineyards on the way into Richmond. And the Richmond golf course is described as no good, no trees. Uh, and so you can see here that he is describing a useful landscape. So maps like this were intended to show not only the potential of the land, but also what had already been achieved. So it's perhaps not surprising that the original camp of Risdon Cove gets no more attention than a label. Bowen's attempt here was almost literally erased from the map. So if we come back to my earlier point about reading against what the intended purpose of the map was, we can see that this chart continues the idea of Van Diemen's Land and Australia as a tabula rasa, a blank slate just waiting uh, for the Europeans to arrive, a blank slate with no pre-existing owners. And although it may have recorded encounters with Indigenous peoples in his journal, not a single mention of them is made on the final map. Now, this is also the stage where messiness can be very obvious. A lot of the maps in the Tasmanian archives uh, have one of three kinds of annotations. The most obvious and common are amendments made when the map was a working document in the survey department. Now, some people find these kind of annotations quite distressing, but they are, should just remind us that they're part of the life cycle of this map and that these documents were usually created for a specific purpose. The de intricate detailing on a map shouldn't lead us to assume that the map was made to be purely decorative. It may have been absorbed into a working collection later in its life, or the surveyor might have just been really proud of his work and wanting to show off his artistic abilities. Now, sometimes the updates were made by the map maker themselves. When Scott updated this chart for four years in a row, he was working with an, a severely understaffed department. This messiness is the direct result of the pressures on a survey department that had only two or three surveyors up until the mid 1820s and thousands of acres to measure and an influx of free settlers coming to claim their land. So here you can see that Scott had no capacity to redraft it. He might have been applying a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it type philosophy to the base map. 
It has several different handwriting styles on it, which added in the different names, as well as pencil and ink annotations. This was a really hard working sheet. But what we can read from this map is the chaos of colonial expansion. This was a survey office that could barely keep up, let alone ahead of the tasks that were needed to be completed. Maps like this show the names crossed out and new names added in. There was a very high mobility as people traded or sold their land all the time and they didn't always keep good records of that. So sometimes the only clue to the chain of different owners who held a particular property is on a map like this and they were only updated when a surveyor happened to visit the area and make a note of the current occupiers. Now another type of messiness that you may not always immediately notice and that is slightly more unusual although uh, still relatively common in some collections is annotations made con contemporaneous to the map's creation. So this one here is a part of the route that Grimes took from Launceston to Hobart. Half of it is lovely with beautiful details showing yet again the different land types and by default therefore their agricultural settlement, agricultural and settlement potential. The strange thing about this map is that it has a whole section of notes and these notes read as a journal of his travels but when they were written remains unclear. Now I vacillate between deciding that they were definitely written with the rest before the rest of the map which was made then around them. Grimes wasn't the first European to follow this route so maybe he had a rough sketch and knew where the blank space would be on the parchment. It is very convenient however that the rivers flow around the words and this suggests that the words were added later although why remains unknown. The most likely answer is a bit of both. The notes guide Grimes in how the map needs to look, but this map is a halfway point between the original notes and the final chart. Another version of this is held by the National Archives of London, uh, and so hopefully when they reopen to um, accepting new orders for digitised um, files, I will be able to get my hands on a copy and get some more answers. But otherwise, I'm open to suggestions. Now, we also occasionally see conversations between individuals and departments trying to work out the story of a map. Here uh, are two notes between members of, I think, the survey department, discussing the purpose of this particular chart. I know no, not I know not what this document is. It was forwarded to me by the late acting surveyor general to whom it is again referred in the hope he will favor me with some explanation. This was sh sent to show that G. Stewart can't have his location on the lagoon by Lincoln Township without encroaching thence. These comments are a reminder of the impermanence of maps. We see these as a part of a large set held in the archives because each one has been catalogued and placed with its friends in a whole series. It's very easy to assume that they are all related, that they connect to each other. Instead, they might have been found in one box together that was the result of someone's really haphazard filing system a hundred years ago and bear absolutely no relation to each other apart from someone's, apart from that filing system. So a map like this tells of this casual usage of maps, that they were disposable or adaptable, that they could be quickly sketched up for a specific purpose, uh, almost as if they'd been drawn on the back of a napkin. So not only does this map contain mess, it also tells us of the messiness of the office that contained it. Now then they, uh, or others, the surveyors or others, would draw up this nicer version, complete with what I like to think of as the decorative twiddly bits. And so this is where we move into much more subtle versions of the mess. We leave behind the scribbles of the journal or the penciled notes by surveyors as they ascertain the purpose of different documents. And these maps are suitable for public consumption. 
Now that said, this illustration that I've used here is unfinished. Some of these uh, elements are still in pencil and not completed. I have no idea why. Uh, it might be that this was a draft version and there is a completed version either lost to time or hidden among someone's heirlooms or Beaumont may have cancelled the project. But we should just take a moment to admire the very strange uh, fork-tailed pig devil that is climbing the tree as well as the man aiming a rifle at some monkeys and another man who I reckon is probably the surveyor leaning on the fence and watching it all happen. Now, although I said that not all beautiful maps were made for display, some were. So by 1823, ideas of proper Englishness were reaching Van Diemen's land as free settlers started to flock into the colony. So this map was made by William Sharland almost as soon as he stepped off the boat. Uh, he would become a stalwart of the survey office, but he was constantly overlooked for promotion and eventually he left the department to go and work privately. But this chart was made when he was young and optimistic and eager to prove his artistic abilities. And artistic abilities they were, for this chart is far more aspirational than truthful. Here what we see is what a gentleman of society sought to create in his gardens. Edward Ford Bromley was a fairly prestigious member of Vandemonian society. He had the position of treasurer of the police fund and he was a foundation shareholder of the Bank of Van Diemen's Land. So it isn't surprising that he wanted a swanky property to show off to his visitors. The colonies were a place of opportunity for a lot of people who would never be able to inherit a large estate in Britain. So a guest would arrive and travel through the fenced park, kept oblivious to the unsightly elements of a working farm. And then they would be treated to views over a tidy garden through which a creek gently babbled. If the guest wished, they could stroll through the garden over a footbridge uh, through the garden meadow and down to the rivulet. But they wouldn't be enforced to endure its uncontrolled form. A hedge blocked it from the view of the house. But how much of this was created, we may never actually know. The landholder, Bromley, was revealed to be a scurrilous rogue after he was found to have committed what the Australian Dictionary of Biography describes as a spectacular misappropriation of funds. Within a few years, all his property had been sold and this land is now covered by the Newtown High School Oval. By the time a map reached the stage of being distributed, it was well out of the hands of the original explorer. Different countries had different expectations of their cartographers and geographers, but it was common for maps to be compiled from a range of sources. In France, the expectations were relatively high, with most surveyors trained in either military or civilian academies. In England, it was generally accepted that it was much harder to come by training with surveyors trained under apprenticeships instead. But that said, as one uh, historian of cartography has put it, to be a map maker in 18th century Paris or London required little more than an interest and the will to set pen to paper. Now this was the time of increasing accuracy in some cartographical practices. The Ordnance Survey and other national equivalents were, developed in de uh, were developing detailed topographical surveys to assist in military manoeuvres. But for most people who bought atlases or single sheets or for the colonial governance who wanted to feel like they owned the land that was so far away, we do have to ask if this level of accuracy was expected by the majority of people. So we've probably all suffered the misfortunes of being misled by a digital map. So perhaps we would agree uh, with this quote. And today we live in a highly mobile society and we have expectations of global accuracy. It is just as likely that we might need a street map of Suva as of Adelaide. But for the masses in the 18th and 19th centuries, the probability of travelling further than the Grand Tour of Europe would take you 
if you even left your city or country, uh, was fairly low. Accuracy in maps of far off places was not relevant. Atlases were intended to aid the imagination and to make you look intelligent. Travel guides were full of exaggerations as the authors relied on their readers never finding out the truth. And there was an element of cultural superiority at play. Van Diemen's Land was full of convicts and inhuman behaviour. And so it was very important for the British Empire, but culturally it was deficient and therefore didn't really matter. So take, for example, this map of 1848, uh, this 1848 map of Van Diemen's Land. It's a really odd mixture of new and old material and demonstrates perfectly how a map was compiled from different sources. The two counties of Cornwall and Buckingham have been, had been long split into smaller counties by the 1840s, but maps in the 1820s did still show them. The Europeans had spread further across the landscape by this point, although this one at least does show the Van Diemen's Land Company in the northwest. The island's name is misspelled, although this also was a very common mistake in the 19th century. But the cover page of this atlas states that these maps have been compiled from the best authorities and follow modern discovery. So did these mistakes matter? No, not really. This kind of messiness, the lack of attention to detail, didn't have broad consequences. Some absences of detail or accuracy, however, were more significant. Throughout the 18th century, attitudes towards uh, First Nations people changed. Early American maps acknowledged the assistance of Indigenous peoples in their explorations, or included details about First Nations sites of insignificance. As we saw with Meehan's map of the Derwent, however, as time went on, they became increasingly absent from these maps. It's been suggested that this was a clash between uh, the growing admiration for explorers and a diminishing recognition of Indigenous intelligence. Well into the 20th century, brave explorers would have us believe that they explored alone. Their porters and their guides remained nameless and the party leader would accept all the praise and glory. To attribute success to the hard work and local knowledge of the indigenous inhabitants was to deny the perceived racial superiority of the colonial powers. These absences were really just as important as the information each map contained. They told the remote reader a story of a British or a French or a Spanish success and encouraged them to support the important work that they were doing to cultivate these ideas and to bring them under the control of the correct people. So I want to finish with this map of Van Diemen's Land with its spectacular error. Now this map was compiled by engraver Sidney Hall who was known for having idea advanced ideas about cartography. He was highly expected, but somehow did manage to triple the size of Macquarie Harbour in 1828. I found this same mistake on a chart from 1841 by Lysers. Immediately, I assumed that he had somehow managed to copy uh, the one and only map of Van Diemen's Land that had made this mistake earlier, Hall's map, when there were so many maps for him to choose from. His map didn't show the extent of, European occupa of British occupation that I would expect to see on this map either. But on reading the notes in the David Rumsey collection, I discovered that Lyser had print reprinted some maps from 1826 in his 1841 atlas. So this means that both he and Hall were engraving this error at about the same time in the mid 1820s. Now in France, it was common for geographers to include details about the sources of their information, but Britain didn't have such high expectations, so we may never know who copied from whom or whether they were both relying on some other source of information. Perhaps some shoddy reporting had come back to London from Van Diemen's Land. <laughs> 
The story of Sidney Hall doesn't end with this map, however. As I mentioned, he was considered a productive engraver until the 1850s, producing atlases and single sheets, uh, updates and commissions. Now, a few years ago, a historian was commissioned to write the entry for him uh, in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. To do so, he wanted to pin down Sydney's exact year, if not date, of death. Now, his work ended in the 1850s, so this is where our historian started looking. Uh, But he couldn't find any record of Sidney Hall dying in the mid-century. He chatted to the archivist, who told him to go looking for the wife instead, uh, joking that she had probably killed him and buried him under the floorboards. Uh, So, he did. He started to look for the wife of Sidney Hall and found her name on a death record for Hall in 1831. So this led him to look closer at the maps that were made by Hall posthumously, uh, and he noticed that they changed from saying by Sydney Hall to by S. Hall. Sydney's wife was called Selina. For 20 years after Sydney's death, she continued his business, engraving her own prints of maps. Now, very few people seem to have known this, but she did record her profession as an engraver in the census. But until only a few years ago, was Selina Hall a completely invisible cartographer of the 19th century? Now, her story is a poignant reminder to always look at the little details of the maps that survive in our archives. Within those details, within the scribbles, the absences, are the secrets of just how messy our histories are. Thank you.